Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new and timely series, The Church in the Last Days. Today, you'll be challenged to reevaluate your commitment to prayer and discover the gift God has given you in today's lesson, Prayer Power. I heard uh, about a church in a small town in Texas. It was a very conservative town. It was a dry town. And uh, uh, a man came to town, a businessman, and he got a permit to build a tavern in this town, a bar. Well, the church didn't like that. And uh, the pastor called the people together and they said, we they said, we can't have this in our town. This won't be good for our town. So they said, we need to pray and ask God to intervene. And so they prayed. They had an all-night prayer meeting about this issue. And they prayed. And it was just a few days later, just, just right before the business was supposed to open, that there was an electrical storm in their town, and a bolt of lightning hit the tavern, and it started a fire, and it burned it to the ground. Well, the church people were excited until... The tavern owner sued the church and said, you caused the fire. They said, we're not responsible for the fire. But it went to court. And in the preliminary hearing, it's, this case was there before the judge. He looked at the case and he said, this is an interesting case. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. But one thing is for certain. The tavern owner believes in the power of prayer and the church people don't. I want to ask you, do you believe in the power of prayer? Now, the, the answer, you know, we're in church. Do you believe in the power of prayer? You know the right answer. The answer is yes. Yes. But for most of us, we struggle in this thing called prayer because we don't feel like we do it very well. And, and we, you know, you hear stories and, and you sing songs, perhaps, sweet hour of prayer, and you're like, man, praying for an hour, that would really be hard. I can't pray for an hour. I struggle to pray for two minutes because how many of you, when you go down to pray, you get on your knees to pray, how many of you have a wandering mind? Anybody have that? Okay. All you other liars out there, you need to pray about your lying. We all struggle with your mind starts to wander. Your mind fills with a million different things. Or you start to pray and it's like you run out of prayer bullets after about the first 60 seconds. It's like, bam, I shot all my prayer bullets and now I don't know what to pray. And then you start wondering, is this doing anything? Is this making a difference? Does God hear me? Uh, do, are my prayers getting through? We have all these questions as it relates to prayer. Well, how would you like for your prayer life to not be something that you have to do, but something that you get to do? How, how would you like to, to know that when I pray, God is hearing me and God is listening? How would you like to have power in your prayers and see your prayers go to a whole nother level? Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. And Paul writes about it to the Thessalonians in chapter 3. This is what he has to say. Finally, brethren. Let's stop there. Anytime you read in the Bible in Paul's letters, finally, brethren, it's not really finally. He's got more to say. But, you know, preachers like to say, now, in conclusion, and then they go on for 10 minutes. So, uh, finally, brethren, but I got 18 more verses here. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. The emphasis of these first five verses is on the issue of prayer. It's on the issue of prayer. 
And so we want to see from this passage that I just read how we can take our prayers to a new level, how we can energize our prayer lives. And I want you to notice four directives that are found in the scripture here that will help your prayer life. Directive number one, recognize the privilege of prayer. The privilege of prayer. Now, he says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Okay, this is significant because you have to remember that the church in Thessalonica, young believers, these people, they haven't been Christians for even a year. They're young in the Lord. Paul is the mature believer. He's on his second missionary journey. Paul has had encounters with Christ and experiences with the Lord Jesus Christ that none of us have ever had. These people didn't have anything like that. And Paul had been seasoned, and Paul had the Damascus Road experience, and then uh, for three years the Lord taught him things. Paul is arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived. And he's asking these young believers, this mature believer, the apostle, great apostle Paul, is asking these young believers, pray for us, pray for me. Pray for Silas, pray for Timothy, pray for us. We need your prayers. Remember this, prayer is not a spiritual gift, it's a spiritual privilege. And it's given to every child of God. And whether you've been a Christian and walking with the Lord for 50 years, or whether you've been a Christian for five minutes, the door to the throne room is open to you. And God invites us to come and pray. God invites us to come up into his lap, so to speak, on the throne and share our heart with him and share our needs with him. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hey, you have needs, I have needs. God has grace to help in our time of need. He says, come with boldness, come with confidence. That word means uh, frankness, it means bluntness, it means uh, boldness to speak. You know, in the military, they'll have that little phrase, permission to speak, sir. Permission granted, and then you can talk because if you, you can't talk to an uh, upper guy in, unless he allows you to do that. Well, the Lord is saying, permission granted, you can speak to me. You can tell me anything that's going on in your heart. You don't have to tell me what you think I want to hear. Share with me what's really going on. Trust in him at all times, oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us and share what's really going on. God wants to hear the song says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Hey, it's a privilege for every child of God to come before the throne of God and to pray. Remember, it's not a gift where some people, oh, they have the gift of prayer. I don't have the gift of prayer. No, prayer is just talking to your father. And whether you're a child that, that struggles to make words or you're somebody that's a junior size Shakespeare, as a dad with three girls, I love to hear my girls talk to me, sit in my lap when they were little and talk to me. I love to talk to them now as adults. But the, the, the throne room is open to all children of God. So that's the first directive. Recognize the privilege of prayer, the privilege. You know, I have privileges as a pastor to know uh, a lot of people, different people in our church, different walks of life. And uh, one of my friends, Matt Blue, has, a, has an automotive garage. And if I ever have a problem with my car, I can just call up Matt. Matt, I got this going on. What do you think? And I always know that I'm not going to get taken to the bank, that Matt's always going to shoot straight with me. He's going to help me out. I have doctor friends. I can call them. I have had this problem and that problem. And I know they're going to shoot straight with me and tell me this is, this is the deal. And, hey, come in to see me. I'll, I'll set aside time for you. Man, that's a great privilege. I have friends in seminary, seminary professors, seminary presidents that I can call and ask them, I don't understand this passage. Help me with this. And they'll talk to me about it. Well, that's a great 
That's a great thing. And you might have some friends like that too. But hey, all of us as believers, we have God who said, hey, come talk to me because I have grace to help in your time of need. I know everything about everything. I know the end from the beginning and I want to help you. The Bible says in Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. God is listening to the prayers of his children. So that's the first directive. Recognize the privilege of prayer. Directive number two, understand the bigger picture of prayer. Now, all of us pray for personal things. We pray for me and mine. I do that. You did that. Do that. Paul did that. The Thessalonians did that. That's normal. That's uh, natural. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you just pray for me and mine, you, you're not looking at the bigger picture because you and yours are not. The, that's a smaller picture. A bigger picture is praying outside of me and mine. And that's what he says in verse one. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men for not all have faith. Now, here are the Thessalonians. They're going through difficult times. So difficult were their times, so much pressure, so much trouble, so much affliction, so much persecution that they thought they had missed the rapture. We must be in the day of the Lord. We must be experiencing the, the wrath of God that Paul told us about was going to come upon the earth because things are bad. They're hard. And so Paul said, hey, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of your hardship, in the midst of your pain, pray for me. Pray for me. And Paul had suffering. Paul had difficulty. Paul had problems. Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this, and he had lots of problems in Corinth. He had a lot of people coming against him, but he says, pray for me. Now, here's the thing. When you get the bigger picture of prayer, and you start to pray for other people. We call that intercessory prayer. You're not just praying for me and mine. You start to pray uh, bigger than that. Intercessory prayer gets your focus off yourself and off your problems. Because we all have a tendency to do that. We get tunnel vision. We just see ourselves and our problems. And so when you start praying outside of yourself and you and yours, then you start to see, hey, there are other people out there that have problems. There are other things to pray for. There are bigger fish to fry, so to speak, than just my problems. Our prayer room had got smoked out in the fire. And so now we've moved the prayer room to the library. And uh, we encourage people, hey, come and, and take an hour in the prayer room. If you don't think you can do an hour, take 30 minutes in the prayer room. Uh, you know, because sometimes an hour, you just think an hour praying, that would be so hard. Can I tell you something that is so wonderful? I read this uh, just yesterday. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It's called the Prince of Preachers. Lived in the 1800s in England. I mean, he was something else. One of the greatest preachers who ever lived. It is said of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he never prayed more than five minutes at a time. Never prayed more than five minutes at a time. You read about some of these guys, they pray for two hours. Charles Haddon Spurgeon never prayed more than five minutes at a time. But they said he never went longer than five minutes between prayer. So that's what it means to pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that, you know, from the time you get up, you're just uh, on your knees until you go to bed. It means you call upon the Lord and you never hang up the phone. You're just always able. The, the line of communication is always open. And so God is not necessarily looking to see how much time are you spending on your knees. I got the clock out. I got the stopwatch. You know, you spent 10 minutes, but if you had spent 15, then I would have answered. So maybe a little more. Adrian Rogers used to say, I don't spend a long time in prayer, but I don't go long between prayer. So that kind of freed me up. Maybe that frees you up too. And so our prayer room is there for intercessory prayer. And maybe you can't do it for an hour, but just do it for 30 minutes. Do it for 45 minutes. Do it for 15 minutes. Just some time where you set aside that I'm going to pray. I'm going to get my eyes off my problems. I'm going to pray for other people. When you go into the prayer room, you read about some big needs that people have. And you start to see, I thought my problems were bad, but man, this, this lady, this person, this situation, that's really bad. And it changes your perspective because you, you get your eyes off yourself and you get your eyes uh, onto being 
uh, somebody the Lord can use to make a difference. So intercessory prayer gets your focus off yourself and off your problems. Secondly, intercessory prayer asks God to spread His Word. Pray for us. He says that the Word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. Pray that, that the Word goes out. Hey, Paul had come to Thessalonica. He preached for three Sabbaths, reasoning in the synagogue, and people responded. The, the Gentiles responded to his message. The Jews didn't, by and large, but the Gentiles did. And they received the message, and they put their faith and trust in Jesus. And the church was born in Thessalonica, and the church began to flourish in Thessalonica, and it flourishes when the word goes out and people respond to the word. James 1.21 says, uh, In humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. The word of God. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God. Literally that means that God breathed on it. The breath of God is in the word of God. And we know that when Jesus in John chapter 3 was talking about the spirit, the word in Greek for the spirit is pneuma. The word in Greek for wind is pneuma. The word in Greek for breath is pneuma. And the Holy Spirit is the wind of God. It's the breath of God. And the breath of God is on the word of God. And so we pray, God, send out your word that it would move swiftly, that it would produce results. You know, when Jesus told that parable about the sower and the seed, the sower went out to sow and he threw his seed. Some seed fell upon the road. Some seed fell upon the shallow ground. Some seed fell upon the thorny ground. Some seed fell upon the good ground. The seed is the word of God and the soil is the heart, the human heart. Some have hard hearts and they're, they're like the road. And when the seed goes on there, the seed can't penetrate. The birds come and take up the seed. The birds are representative of the devil and his demons. He said, some seed falls on the shallow ground. The shallow ground is the emotional heart. It's the heart that hears the message, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I want to do that, but hasn't thought it through. And when the sun of persecution comes out, then they wither and die. There's no firm root. There's no depth of soil there. It's just an emotional quick decision that's not genuine and real. And then you have people that have the crowded heart and they're worried about the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the word gets in there and gets choked out by all these other things, by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. But then he says, some seed falls on the good soil and that's the heart that receives it. And that, the good and honest heart, it says in the book of Luke, and that person grows and that seed that is sown in their hearts, 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold. Hey, we are to pray for people that as the word goes, that it wouldn't hit a hard heart, that it wouldn't hit a shallow heart, that it wouldn't hit a, a crowded heart, that it would hit a good heart. That, that God would do a work so that people would have good hearts to respond to the word that is able to save their souls. And then intercessory prayer asks God to deliver his workers. That's what Paul asked them to do. Hey, we want the word to, to be glorified. We want the word to go forth, make a difference. And then he says in verse 2, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men for not all have faith. Hey, Thessalonians, you guys had faith. You were the good soiled hearts. And when the word came, you received it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which is able to change lives and do a wonderful work. But when we preach, Paul is saying, not everybody has faith. And not everybody likes the message that we preach. Paul had difficulty pretty much every city he went to. You know why he was in Thessalonica for such a short time? No more than six months max. It's because of the persecution. And the persecution was so hot and so heavy, he had to leave there. And from there, he goes to Berea, and, and things are going good in Berea, but then they come after him. Those Jews in Thessalonica that ran him out of Thessalonica, they come to Berea to run him out of Berea. He goes from Berea to Athens. He's just there a short time in Athens, and then he ends up in Corinth. He stays a year and a half in Corinth. In Corinth, he does what he always does. He goes to the synagogue, and he preaches and shows the people how Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He reasons from the Scripture, from the Old Testament Scripture, to show that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Jews, by and large, reject that message. So he's preaching there in 
Corinth. And finally, he just says, forget it. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. Well, the Gentiles received his message. And so he builds a church in Corinth. But the Jews don't say, okay, well, that's fine. You can have that church over here. We just still have our synagogue over there. No, they're trying to silence him. They're trying to shut him up. They, they're going to end up trying to kill him, uh, as you read in the book of Acts, because they hate his message. Because why? Because he's preaching Jesus who was crucified by the hands of the Jews who said, not this man, but Barabbas. Uh, the, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, they said, quit talking about this man, Jesus. You're going to bring his blood on our heads. That's what the religious leaders said. Well, no kidding, because you're guilty of saying crucify him, crucify him. But they didn't want that, and so there was tremendous resistance. Now, Paul is asking them, pray for us that God would deliver us because not all men have faith and some people are evil and perverse and they're trying to shut us down. And they prayed, obviously, and God answered their prayer. And you read in Acts chapter 18 exactly what happened. So Paul is preaching in Corinth. He sets up a church in Corinth. Uh, right next door to the synagogue, he starts a church. Well, the Jews are coming at him, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 18 that the Lord came to Paul in a vision, and he said, Paul, don't be afraid any longer. Paul was afraid. He didn't know if this was it, if I was going to die here, what, what's going to happen here in Corinth. Don't be afraid any longer, Paul. I have many people in this city. Uh, I will protect you. And so Paul went on preaching. But then it says this in Acts 18, verse 12. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, before the Bema seat. That's where the, the magistrate would go to decide cases. That's like court, the Bema seat. I've been to Corinth on a couple of occasions. I've been on that Bema seat that he's talking about. And the Gallio was there, and the Jews came and said, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth and defend himself, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourself. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat, and they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. And Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. God delivered Paul that day. Paul didn't even have to defend himself in answer to the Thessalonians' prayer. Hey, recognize the privilege of prayer. Whether you've been saved five minutes or 50 years, the access to the Lord, the throne room door is open. Understand the bigger picture of prayer. We want to pray that God's word goes out. We want to pray for people to respond to the word. We want to pray for God to protect his frontline workers. Thirdly, cling to the promise of prayer. The promise of prayer. He says in verse 2, not all men have faith, but the Lord is faithful. Verse 3, the Lord is faithful. Men don't have faith, but the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. Cling to the fact that God is faithful. He's faithful. What he says in his word, he will do. It's impossible for God to lie. This is what the Lord says. Prayer promise. Jeremiah 33. Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, who made the earth, the Lord who formed it, established it, the Lord is his name, call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Hey, does it pay to, to pray? Is God going to listen to me? He says so. He says, call to me, and I will answer you. Here's the thing, okay? You call him up, like on the phone, call him up. God doesn't necessarily answer on the first ring. You see, we, get, we, get, we throw in the towel on prayer. Why? Because, well, I'm calling and God's not answering. Always remember this little three-letter word in prayer, yet. Yet. God hasn't answered yet. 
but, but keep calling and don't quit. The Lord loves persistence. He told us about parables in the Bible about persistence. A friend at midnight, he kept knocking on the door. Hey, open up for me. I have to feed a friend of mine who came at midnight. No, go away. No, he wouldn't stop knocking. And Jesus would say, because of his persistence, the man got up and gave him everything that he needed. God loves when we're persistent. God loves it when we call upon his faithfulness. God loves it when we take his word and we cling to it. Like a dog with a T-bone steak, we're just not going to let go. The Lord is faithful to his word. What God has promised, he is also able to perform. Now, if you struggle with what to pray, here's the thing to do. See, prayer and the word of God go together. Acts chapter 6, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer and the word of God go together. So when you have a quiet time, when you have time with the Lord, spend time in the word and don't just say, well, I'm going to have Bible time and now prayer time. Put them together. And as you read the Bible, when things come up and, uh, you know, things speak to your heart, then pray that back to the Lord. Say, Lord, look what you did for them. Can you do that in my life? Lord, Lord, would you uh, do what you did here? Would you do that for me? Uh, Lord, this is a promise in Scripture, and God, that's a promise I'm going to hold on to. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, I have this need. I have this financial need. I have this emotional need. I have this marriage need. I have this family need. Lord, you said that you would provide for all my needs. Lord, you said that I could come and I'd receive grace to help in my time of need. Lord, I'm claiming that today. See, we, we have this phrase, name it and claim it. You can't name it and claim it. But when God names it, then you can claim it. When you find a promise in Scripture that is for, uh, for you as a child of God, then you can claim that, that God, you promised you would do this. God loves it when we do that. So cling to the promise of prayer and don't let go. Now, there are promises that we have in Scripture that we can cling to, and then there are things that we want and we pray about, but we don't necessarily have the promise that this is going to happen. Let me give you a big one. Marriage. If you're having marital problems, and, and I pray, you know, some people have had the, the issue where uh, the, the spouse goes off the rails and starts to... Uh, see other people and commits adultery and doesn't want to stop committing adultery and, and the, the wife will pray or the husband or whoever the wounded party is, they pray and pray and pray. Well, God said he was going to do this. Listen, there's no promise in Scripture that God is ever going to override somebody's will. The Lord doesn't want people to do sin. He doesn't want to see homes destroyed. But you can pray and pray and pray and if that person is hardened, then it's, they're not going to respond. So we tell people all the time, hey, the only person you can change is you, is you. So change you, work on you. We uh, so often want God, God fix this person. And the Lord says, uh, you, you trust me with that person, but let me work on you. Let me work on you. You know, salvation is another one. We pray for people to be saved. Does that mean if we pray for everybody to be saved that everybody's going to be saved? No, no. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance that doesn't mean that we quit praying and we just keep bringing that person before the Lord. Lord, I want you to save this person. George Mueller was a great man of faith and a great man of prayer. God put five of Mueller's friends on his heart to pray for them, to pray for their salvation. So he began to pray. Pray for these five guys every day. He's praying for these five guys. After a couple of months, one of those five guys came to know Christ. Man, Mueller was praising the Lord. Ten years later, after praying, Two other guys of those five friends came to Christ. That was awesome. 25 years later, the fourth guy came to know Christ. The fifth guy, Mueller, kept praying and praying and praying and praying. And 52 years later, at George Mueller's funeral, that guy received Christ as Savior and Lord. Hey, we don't have the, the promise that God is going to do that every time, but we don't throw in the towel. We keep bringing that person to the Lord. Hey, prayer changes things because God answers prayer. He is faithful. So cling to the promise of prayer. And then fourthly, 
Focus on the Lord of prayer. Focus on the Lord of prayer. Verse 5 is Paul's prayer for them. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. May the Lord direct your hearts. Hey, we have the faithfulness of God and we trust what God has said, but then we focus on God himself. Now, here is the danger that you and I have in the Christian life. We start out, this is how it works for most people. We start out, when you go from darkness to light, when you receive Christ as Savior and Lord, when the light comes on and the Lord comes in, the life comes in, man, everything is different. You've been born again. There is joy. There's peace. There's power. There, there's a desire to learn, a desire to grow. I mean, God just moved into your life, and you are excited about Him. And uh, man, Bible study time is fun time, and church is like, wow, this is awesome. We're singing about the Lord, and there's an excitement there. But as anybody knows, it's kind of like the honeymoon phase. That can't sustain you for your whole Christian life. Just like you, you, Debbie and I have been married for 30 uh, years. And uh, we, <laughs> 34, 33, don't tell her. She was in the last service. I didn't use this illustration then. But I think 34. Anyway, uh, you know, it's not going to be 34 years. is not just honeymoon uh, time for 34 years. It just doesn't work like that. There are ups and downs. The same in your relationship with God, ups and downs. Sometimes emotionally, you're just filled to the brim, and sometimes, man, your tank is low. And here's the thing you got to watch for. you got to watch for not getting in a rut with the Lord, where everything becomes stale. And, and quiet time is just you kind of just mindlessly read whatever psalm or proverb or passage that you have for that day or chapter and you mindlessly pray a prayer list you're just kind of reading down like a laundry list like a grocery list just da, 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 da. and your mind is a million miles away listen this scripture paul's prayer may the lord direct your hearts into the love of god hey keep your heart in a love relationship with the lord that's what Christianity is all about. It's all about a love relationship with God. It's all about heart. That's why Jesus got on to the Pharisees. Why? Because they made it all about rules. And he said to those Pharisees, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me. You're wasting your time worshiping me if your heart is far away from me. Teaching his doctrines, the precepts of men. It's all about heart. That's why the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment, Jesus said. And the danger in the Christian life for you, for me, for all of us, for Paul, is that we drift away. We do what the church in Ephesus did, Revelation chapter 2. You've left your first love. You're not in love with me like you used to be. You hardly talk to me anymore when you come through the door at the end of the day. What happened to that first love when you were so in love with me, when you were so passionate? May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God where you understand how much he loves you and you love him back. It is key to stay there and to keep your focus on the Lord of prayer. See, if all prayer was, was to get answers. I come before the Lord, bam, he just hands out answers. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. I mean, if it was just immediate, part of us would love that, right? Man, I got a need, God answered just like that. What would happen if that were to take place? You wouldn't spend much time with God. You would just come to God to get. You wouldn't come to God to spend time with him. And that's what God is interested in, spending time with you. Hey, I love my three girls. I love spending time with them. If, if they just came to me when they wanted something, hey, dad, said a nice couple of nice things to me, but really what they wanted was just for me to give them some money. That's all we want, dad, just give me some money. And then, then they're gone. I mean, I wouldn't like that at all. I would feel so used. We do that with God. God, we just want you to do for us. That's why it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
Not my hand, not what I can do for them, but my face. Seek me. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. When you want God, you don't want his stuff, you want him. Whether he does anything for you or not, that's okay. I just want to be in your presence. I think about Sandy Patty when she had her her moral meltdown and was lying about it, and she was living in adultery and lying about it. She finally got to the end of herself, and she said in her book, Broken on the Back Row, she came to the place, she said, you know what? I don't care what people find out about me. I don't care what is said about me. I just want to be right with God. I just want to have that relationship with God. Bring back the new again. I want to see you again. Bring back the way it was when we first began. Hey, keep your focus on the Lord. Keep your heart in a love relationship with Jesus and keep your eyes fixed on him. Now, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. The steadfastness of Christ. That's the Greek word hupomone. It means to remain under. It means a patient enduring. They were going through difficulties. There's a part of anybody that as you go through difficulties, you want to quit You want to throw in the towel. This is too hard. He said, no, may the Lord direct your hearts into the steadfastness of Christ so that you can remain under, so that you can patiently endure the difficulties that you're going through. How do we do that? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Hebrews chapter 12 says, let us run with endurance, hupomone, patient endurance, the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, endured again, hupomone, a form of it, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured, hupomone, the form again, such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. How in the world did Jesus do all the things that he did? Who for the joy set before him? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He set the joy before him. The cross is horrible. He's sweating blood in the garden because he does not want to go to the cross. He does not want to take the sin of the whole world upon himself and experience the judgment and the wrath of God. He doesn't want to have fellowship in the Trinity, which existed in eternity past, to be broken because of sin, because God can't have fellowship with sin, and that sin was going to be on his own son, and the Lord was going to have to turn away. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't want that, but for the joy set before him, he said, it's worth it. Not my will, but yours be done. Because I go to the cross, I bear the sin of the whole world, and that tears the veil from top to bottom so that now there is access to God and we can preach a gospel that says whosoever will may come and if you take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. That's because Jesus went to the cross. That's because he set the joy before him. It was worth it to him. And whatever difficulty you're going through, trust me, it's nothing compared to what he went through. Nothing in comparison to that. It's Something to us, it's nothing compared to him. How do you get through it? You fix your eyes on Jesus. You fix your eyes on Jesus. You're going through a hard time physically, fix your eyes on Jesus. A hard time financially, fix your eyes on Jesus. A hard time in your marriage, in your family, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Look to the reward. Look to see what God is going to do. Hey, you can get through any difficulty in life if you'll remember three things. God is good. God loves me. And God works all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is good. I can trust him. God loves me. I know he has what's best for me. And God is going to work. However bad it is right now, he's going to work it together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Hey, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. My friend, the Lord is coming soon. And the big question is this, are you ready? If you're not, today is the day to get ready. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins 
and you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.